Hello friends, in this video we are going to talk about a very important topic that is approach to the thyroid swelling. So this is a very important topic both for the undergraduate and the postgraduate exams and even for the entrance exams. There are a lot of questions asked on this topic so we should know the clear algorithm of the approach to the thyroid swelling. So we will be following the latest American Thyroid Association guidelines and uh, let us uh, start by looking into the algorithm. Thyroid swelling also known as goiter. Before we begin with the approach to the thyroid swelling, let us see what is the basic definition of goiter. So goiter basically means any visible or palpable enlargement of the thyroid gland. After we have seen the definition of goiter, which is any visible or palpable enlargement of the thyroid gland, let us look into how do we approach a patient if we are sitting in an OPD and a patient comes to us with a thyroid swelling, what are the ways to approach a thyroid swelling? Let us start by looking at the algorithm. First thing that we have to remember is just like in a breast swelling, the management starts with the triple assessment. Similarly, for a thyroid swelling, the management starts with the quadruple assessment. Now, what are the four components included in the quadruple assessment? We have to be very clear about the components in the quadruple assessment. Number one, it is the history and the clinical examination. We should have take a detailed history and clinical examination to find out the cause of the thyroid swelling, to find out whether it's benign or malignant, to find out whether there is any compression symptoms and whether it is a euthyroid or a thyrotoxic features. So we have to take a detailed history and clinical examination. The next step is we have to do laboratory investigations. The first investigation, the most important is the thyroid function test. And among the thyroid function tests, the most important is the TSH. The next thing that we do is ultrasound of the thyroid gland. And if there is any suspicious lesions in the neck, we also do ultrasound of the neck. So ultrasound of the thyroid gland and the neck. And the last thing, the most important is we go for ultrasound guided FNAC from the thyroid swelling. So these are the four components in the quadruple assessment that we should be very clear of before we move ahead with the individual components. So let us see the individual components now. So the first component that is history and clinical examination. So our basic purpose of taking the history is to find out whether the patient is having a benign swelling or a malignant swelling. So first thing, benign versus malignant. Now let us see how do we differentiate a benign versus malignant. We take a history of whether there has been a rapid increase in the size of the swelling. Because if there is a history of rapid increase, it goes in favor of malignant lesion. Also, if there is any other surrounding swelling in the neck, because that might suggest a lymph node. So history of any other adjacent swelling in the neck. So these are very important history that should be taken. Also, there are features to differentiate benign from malignant. If there is presence of any feature of metastasis, like any recent onset bone pain, any recent onset severe headache, convulsions, or any recent onset jaundice, this all go in favor of metastasis. So that indicates again a malignant disease. We should also keep in mind that presence of any compression effects in the neck. We will be looking at the next point. Presence of any compression features might also go in favor of malignancy. So next point that we are going to keep in mind while taking the history is whether the patient is having any pressure symptoms. Now, what are the things that might get compressed in the neck due to a thyroid swelling? The first is you have to keep in mind, number one is the trachea. So due to compression of the trachea, the patient might be complaining of shortness of breath. The patient might have respiratory distress, difficulty in breathing. Because of the compression on the trachea, the patient might have difficulty in breathing. Also, the next structure that might get compressed is the nerve. That is the most common nerve to be compressed is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The recurrent laryngeal nerve compression will lead to the problem with the voice. So what will be the change in the voice due to nerve compression? The patient might have recent onset hoarseness of voice. So we have to take a history of whether the patient developed any recent onset hoarseness of voice. Also, because of the compression, the patients, not only there will be change of voice, also there will be easy fatigability of voice. So it is said that the timbre of the voice is lost because of this compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, what are the other structures that might get compressed? There are vessels in the neck, important vessels which might get compressed because of thyroid swelling. The most important among them is the carotid vessels. Now, if the carotid vessel gets compressed, what will happen? The patient will get history of syncope, multiple recurrent episodes of syncope. Also, if the jugular vessels get compressed, the patient will give history of puffiness of the face because the venous return will be compromised. So there will be puffiness of the face. 
Well, the first thing in the history we should keep in mind to differentiate between the benign and malignant also whether any pressure symptoms are present or not and what are the pressure symptoms we know them now let us move ahead and look at the third important point that should be kept in the history the third important point is we must try to ask whether the patient is euthyroid or not or the patient is having any thyrotoxic feature the euthyroid versus thyrotoxicosis let us see what are the histories we take in favor of euthyroid to differentiate between euthyroid and thyrotoxic features. Let us see from top to bottom. So from the CNS, we will take history of insomnia. This will go in favor of thyrotoxicosis. The next history that we take from CNS is heat intolerance. The patient will have profuse sweating and heat intolerance. So this is very important history that goes in favor of thyrotoxicosis. Then we will take history of double vision because there is thyroid ophthalmopathy present in some patients with thyrotoxicosis and presence of thyroid ophthalmopathy is a hallmark of Graves' disease. Then we move down, we might find features of muscle wasting and if we move further distally, there will be tremors in the extremities. Then if we move to the cardiovascular system, in the cardiovascular system, there will be features of palpitation, history of chest pain. If we move further down in the GIT, patient will have history of diarrhea. And this is one situation, thyrotoxicosis, where the appetite is increased, but still in spite of the increased appetite, there will be weight loss. In women, there will be amenorrhea. Menstrual irregularities are common in thyroid disease. Amenorrhea is seen in thyrotoxicosis. Menorrhagia is seen in hypothyroidism. So these are the features to differentiate between a euthyroid versus thyrotoxicosis. These are the different points we should keep in mind while taking the history so that we can get a basic idea whether the thyroid swelling which is present is benign or malignant, whether it has any compression symptoms or not, whether it's euthyroid or thyrotoxicosis because the treatment varies with the diagnosis. So let us move ahead to the second point of the quadruple assessment. So after the history and clinical examination, we should keep in mind if we find that a patient is having a diffuse goiter, we should keep in mind about the possibility of a physiological goiter in pregnant patients and in patients who are in puberty and therefore stop further evaluation in these patients because this will eventually subside. But in other cases of diffuse goiter or in solitary thyroid nodules or multinodular goiter, we should continue with the following quadruple assessment. So the second step in the quadruple assessment being thyroid function test. Now in the thyroid function test, the most important among them is the serum TSH. When we do a serum TSH, there are two possibilities. It can either be low or it can be high. Though it can be normal as well. Even if it is high or normal, the approach goes the same way. If the serum TSH is low, this suggests there is a possibility of hyperthyroidism. And in that case, we go for radioisotope iodine scan. And we use iodine 123 for that. And depending on the radioisotope iodine scan, there can be either hot nodules or cold nodules. If there is more uptake, it will give hot nodules. And if there is less uptake of the isotope, then it will give a cold nodule. Now, there is more chance of malignancy if there is presence of cold nodules. And therefore, if there is a cold nodule, we will continue with the further assessment by ultrasound. But if there is a hot nodule, in that case, we will prefer to go for surgery or we will go for radio iodine ablation. So in case of a hot nodule, we prefer to go for treatment directly. In case of a cold nodule, we go for ultrasound evaluation further. Let us see what we do if the TSH level is normal or high. If the TSH is high or normal, the next thing that we do is ultrasound evaluation of the thyroid gland or the neck. Now this brings us to the third point of the quadruple assessment. The third point was the USG of the thyroid gland. If we do an ultrasound of the thyroid gland, the result can be of two types. The thyroid goiter can be either a cystic swelling or a solid lesion. Now, if there is a cystic swelling, the approach is slightly different. Now, compared to a solid lesion, if there is a solid thyroid nodule, then what we do, the ultrasound reporting is done based on the thyroid system. And based on the thyroid system, let us see what are the different types of classification. So, the thyroid lesion one suggests that it's probably a benign lesion. We will look into the criteria which are taken into account while during the thyroid staging. If the thyroid stage is 2, it is usually suggestive of a non-suspicious lesion. If the thyroid is 3, it is mild suspicious of malignancy. And if the thyroid is 4, it is moderate suspicious of malignancy. And if the thyroid is 5, it is highly suspicious of malignancy. So these are the thyroid staging. Thyroid staging is very significant. So what are the different criteria which are taken into account during the thyroid staging? So what are the parameters we look for in the ultrasound? We can remember the parameters by this mnemonic, tall shape. 
if the lesion is taller than wide then it is suggestive of a malignant lesion if the lesion is solid compared to cystic then this is more chance of being malignant if the lesion is hyperechoic on ultrasound there is more chances of malignancy if the margins of the lesion are irregular then it is more suggestive of cancer and if the ultrasound suggests some punctate calcifications then these are also suggestive of malignant lesion so these are the parameters that we look for in the ultrasound and based on this we give some scores and based on those scores we give the thyroid staging and depending on the thyroid staging we can identify whether the patient is having benign non suspicious mild moderate or severely suspicious lesion now depending on this thyroids we decide whether we do an fnac or not we will see that subsequently now let us see what we do if we find a cystic lesion if we find a cystic lesion on the ultrasound the next thing that we do is we aspirate the cyst content now on aspiration of the cyst content we do cytology of that aspirate and if the cytology comes out to be benign we can just follow up the patient for any increase in the size of the cyst or any complexity of the cyst now if the aspirate turns out to be blood hemorrhagic or malignant or if the size of the cyst is more than 4 cm or if the cyst has been aspirated previously 3 times but still the cyst persists after 3 times aspiration a persistence of the cyst all these are indications for surgery so when do we surgery if the aspirate is hemorrhagic or if the aspirate suggestive of malignant cells or if the size of the cyst is more than 4 cm or previously 3 times has been aspirated and now after third recurrence we go for surgery so this is the basic management for a thyroid cyst now again we move back to the thyroid nodule which is solid and has been staged according to the thyroids now depending on the thyroid staging we decide whether the patient will require an fnac or no so this brings us to the fourth component of the quadruple assessment that is fnac fine needle aspiration cytology it is recommended by the american thyroid association that the fine needle aspiration cytology fnac is preferably done under image guidance so that there is increase in the specificity of the outcomes after we get the thyroid staging when do we do fnac from a thyroid nodule again we write down the thyroids we know that one is benign and two is non suspicious it is recommended by the american thyroid association that in one and two fnac is not recommended from thyroid 3 to 5 fnac is recommended as per american thyroid association now there is a size criteria above which the ultrasound suggestive of certain size we go for fnac in thyroid 3 it is suggested that fnac is to be done if the size of the lesion is more than equals to 2.5 cm similarly in the thyroid 4 if the size of the lesion is more than equals to 1.5 cm then only we go for fnac even if it is smaller in size in thyroid 4 because since there is higher risk of malignancy for a small size we go for fnac and in thyroid 5 if the size is even more than 1 cm we go for fnac because there is high chance of malignancy so we have done the fnac for patients whom we are suspecting a malignant lesion now the fnac reporting is to be done as per bethista classification now let us see what is the bethista classification of fnac reporting depending on the bethista system classification we decide what treatment has to be done for age group so let us look into the different categories under bethista classification of fnac reporting now the number one category is the non diagnostic if the fnac result is non diagnostic we call it bethista 1 now in case is inconclusive we call it bethista 1 what is bethista 2 bethista 2 if the fnac report is suggestive of benign findings we call it bethista 2 bethista 3 is if there is atp of undetermined significance or follicular neoplasm of undetermined significance in that case we call it bethista 3 bethista 4 is follicular neoplasm bethista 4 is follicular neoplasm we cannot differentiate a benign versus malignant follicular cancer depending on the fnac result we need a histopathological confirmation so on fnac we can only say that it's a follicular neoplasm that is bethista 4 now bethista 5 is suggestive of suspicious of malignancy if the lesion is suspicious of malignancy we call it bethista 5 and bethista 6 is when you have a confirmed malignancy if you are confirmed of the malignancy we call it bethista It's based on the Bethista system, we can have these different findings of the FNAC report. Now, let's see what we do if we find a non-diagnostic report in FNAC. In case of a non-diagnostic or inconclusive report, we have to do a repeat FNAC, and this time the repeat FNAC has to be 
under ultrasound guidance. If the benign report comes out to be benign, we do clinical and radiological follow-up. How long do we follow up until we get further to negative reports and follow-up? Then the follow-up is done at one year interval. If we find that the FNSC reporting is Bethesda 3, that is a DP of undetermined significance or follicular neoplasm of undetermined significance, we go for repeat FNSC in these patients because if it turns out to be malignancy, the further management changes and the patient will be taken up for surgery. So in patients of a TP of undetermined significance, we go for finical aspiration biopsy of FNSC. Now if we find that the report of Bethesda classification is from 4 onwards, that is follicular neoplasm onwards, in all these patients, we have to go for surgery because there is increased risk of malignancy in these patients. So what are the risks of malignancy in follicular neoplasm? In follicular neoplasm, there is 35% risk of malignancy. Whereas in case of Bethesda 5, that is suspicious of malignancy, there is 60% risk of malignancy. Whereas in case of Bethesda 6, there is 97 to 99% risk of malignancy. So in all of the following conditions, we take the patient for surgery. Now, whether we go for a lobectomy, hemitheratectomy or a near total thyrectomy or total thyrectectomy, it depends on the size of the primary lesions or it depends on the subtype of the cancer. According to the shorts, it says that if we have confirmed malignancy or follicular cancer, in these patients, we prefer for total thyroidectomy. If the size of the primary tumor is more than 4 cm, we go for total thyroidectomy because these patients have chance of micrometastasis into the other lobe as well in case of follicular cancer. But in case of a papillary cancer, even if the size of the lesion tumor is more than 1 cm, we go for total thyroidectomy. So this is very important information as per the American Thyroid Association guidelines. So when we go for total thyroidectomy in follicular cancer and when we go for total thyroidectomy in case of papillary cancer, there, there are other parameters taken into account, risk factors also. Basically, this has been the total approach to a patient with a wider patient with a thyroid nodule or a thyroid swelling but definitely we should always remember that if a patient is having a diffuse goiter always rule out a physiological goiter before starting evaluation of the patient again a quick review we will do a complete history and clinical examination followed by thyroid function test and depending on the thyroid function test if it turns out to be high or normal we go for ultrasound assessment and if the ultrasound comes out to be solid tumor we go for thyroids depending on the tall shape criteria we give thyroids one to five and depending on the thyroids criteria we decide whether the fnc has to be done or not if the thyroids is three onwards we go for fnc and the bethesda class Classification is reported as per the FNSC finding from 1 to 6 and depending on the Bethesda classification we decide what the further treatment has to be done. Though this is the basic approach that has to be understood very clearly before we move into the detail of the thyroid cancer, before we move into the detail of the management of individual thyroid cancer, lymph node dissections and the follow-up of the post-operative patients that will be covered in a separate lecture. Stay tuned to this channel for more lectures, subscribe the channel and drop your feedback in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching this video.